Well, good morning and welcome back to Sunday School here at Hickory Grove. So glad to have you join us as we continue our study through the Gospel Project. And if you've been with us for some time, you'll know we're in the book of Hebrews. Today we're going to look at perhaps the most famous chapter in the book of Hebrews, the famed Hebrews chapter 11. We're even going to pick up a little of chapter 12. For in Hebrews 11, we see the great subject, the great doctrine of faith explained perhaps more clearly than in any other text in the Bible. And so if you have a Bible, turn with me to Hebrews 11. And how about I do this? Let me read just verse 1. And maybe I'll read all the way down to verse 3. Let me read verses 1 through 3 and let that serve as, the, as a way to get us going. I'll pray for ask God to help us. And then we'll unpack, kind of at a high level, all of chapter 11. And we'll even pick up a few verses in chapter 12. Beginning now in Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Would you join me now as we pray? Father in heaven, I ask now that you would come and minister your word to your people. Use me in spite of me as a means to that end, I pray for Christ's sake. Amen. I've known the Lord since the Lord, have in the loosest sense of the term loved the Lord for as long as I can remember. I had the great privilege of being raised in a believing home. I had parents who brought me to a local church from as early as I can recall. I remember being sensitive to things of the Lord, hearing a preacher as I would kind of look down and make shadow puppets on the, uh, on the floor of the worship center. Uh, we had those microfiber pews and I would run my finger up and down them and kind of like draw pictures in them. Nevertheless, even though I was demonstrating basic childlike behavior, I was listening, I was picking up on things. I had a sensitivity to the Lord. My mother would pray over us every night. She'd even sing a song of blessing over us. And as I would hear that song and pray to the Lord with her and my father and brother and sister, I always believed in the loosest sense of the term that God was real. I had a knowledge. I, there was a, an assent, you could go so far as to say. I not only knew things about the Lord, I mentally assented to them. Oftentimes you'll hear the word believe be associated with that, but I want you to feel a deeper weight to the word believe. At that stage in my life, I knew a lot about the Lord. But then something happened at 12 years of age. After six or so years of, you know, being intellectually mature enough to start grappling with things of the Lord, after six years of investment, of knowing things and even assenting with my will to these things, saying, God, I not only know things about you, I actually think that those things are true, something radically happened when I was 12. Something happened that differed from both the things I knew about the Lord and my will to say those things were true, my assent to those things. Something happened. That something is what the Bible calls a miracle. That something is what the Bible calls unusual. That something is what the Bible calls a gift. For you see, what happened when I was 12 years of age is what the Bible calls faith. At 12 years of age, I placed my faith in Christ. So when I use that word faith, indeed when the Bible uses that word faith, it means more than just mere knowledge. It means more than just mere assent or approval of these things. There's something more involved there. And to know what we mean, what the Bible means by the word faith, as I've already said, there's perhaps no better place to go than the book of Hebrews chapter 11. For here we see, as I've already read, a clear explanation, explication of the word faith. What does it mean? And what I'd like to do today is, in light of this text, I want us to look at the what. What is it? Kind of a definition of sorts. What is faith? And then we're going to look at the who. 
who has lived by faith. I think that's going to help us understand faith a little bit better to see some examples of this thing called faith. And then finally, we're going to answer the more practical how. How then shall we live? What does it mean for you and I to live by faith? And I kind of as a summary statement that I think we ought to just chew on for a moment. It's not profound, but it's a statement you really ought to reckon with. If you are in Christ, if you would say that I have a life with Christ, then you must therefore conclude that a life in Christ is a life of faith. They're not separate. If you are in Christ, you are living by faith. And so let's look at the what. What does it mean to live by faith? Uh, Let's look at the how. How might we live by faith? And we're even in the middle going to squeeze in the who. Who in this text lived by faith? And hopefully that will inform us. So if you're taking notes, mark this down. Number one, let's look at what a life of faith is really is. And we see that particularly in verse 1 of chapter 11 where it says, now faith is, and he says two things, it's the assurance of things hoped for and it's the conviction of things not seen. Now what is he getting at when this writer says faith is both the assurance of things hoped for and it's the conviction of things not seen? Well, Let's start with what it is, and then we'll kind of clarify by what it's not. So what this writer is getting at is simply this. When he says faith is the assurance of things hoped for, he is saying it's a confidence. That word assurance is somewhat of a synonym of confidence. It's a confidence, and let's put it more particularly, it's a confidence in the present, meaning Faith is not a confidence in the past merely. For example, oftentimes people believe they have faith because they made a profession of that faith at one time in the past, whether at Bible school or in response to the pastor giving an invitation. Maybe it was at your baptism. The Bible does not look at faith as a past event that has present and future benefits. Faith is always something active in the present. It is the assurance of things hoped for, the confidence of things that you have placed your hope in. So, if you want to have assurance of things hoped for, you must be presently confident. I think probably the word we oftentimes associate with this more than any other is the word trust. You are presently confident trusting that this is true. And you've heard the, I mean, it's a, it's a u- often probably overused analogy, but it's a good one. It's the analogy of, okay, sitting in a chair. If I were to point to a chair, you could say, yeah, I believe that chair is a chair. It'll hold me up. And maybe you could even say, 15 years ago, I sat down in that chair and it held me up. So I believe, I have faith that that chair is a chair. And then I s- invite you to take a seat in it and you refuse. You're like, well, I don't know. I'm not sure if it's going to hold me today. You know, I've gained a little weight or that chair looks like it's gotten a little rickety. I'm not sure I'm going to sit in that chair. Well, that is a good example of somebody that doesn't have faith in that chair. You may have had a faith in it at one time, but you are not presently confident trusting in that chair. The Bible does not describe that as faith. The Bible describes that as phony faith, false faith. That is, that's not real trust. It's assurance Right now, you are sure of that chair. You are sure of what Christ has said, who he is and what he said. It's a confidence in the presence. Oh, God, I am trusting you right now. God, as weak as my faith may be, I am trusting you this moment. Which, if you are struggling with assurance of salvation, maybe you're struggling this moment wondering, am I real? My strong plea to you is not to look to something in the past. Don't look back at your baptism. Don't look back at, you know, the evangelist who told you to write something in the front cover of your Bible, as well intended as I trust that was. The Bible says, if you want assurance of salvation, look now to Christ. Saving faith is active, present faith. Look to Him. And can you this moment say, Jesus, as weak as my faith is, Jesus, as sinful as my sin-stricken soul is, I am trusting you this moment. If you can do that, 
That, brothers and sisters, is assurance of salvation. Throw yourself on the mercy of Christ and plead that He will be for you what you cannot be for yourself. It's confidence in the presence. present. Moreover, we should also clarify that it is conviction for the future. For notice he also clarifies it's the conviction of things not seen. In other words, faith is trusting that what God has said He will do, He will in fact do. It is a conviction, a deep-seated belief. I think the best way to differentiate a conviction and a belief is belief can kind of seem arbitrary. You know, like, yeah, I've just decided that I'm going to do this. Whereas a conviction is something you can't help but believe. Like there's really nothing that's going to change it. You are just so deeply convinced. You are so rock solid sure that this is true, that it's going to be hard for anybody to convince you otherwise. It's a conviction. And he says faith is the conviction of things not seen. Now let's pause for a moment and recall, let's remember that that doesn't mean faith is blind. It doesn't mean that faith would be just mere knowledge, you know, some sort of intellectual project. It's not mere feeling, some sort of subjective, you know, faith is just this wishy-washy thing. Moreover, faith is not mere optimism. It's not some sort of, well, I've already said it, some sort of just blind, well, you know what, I'm just going to believe it. Who cares what anybody else says? A conviction of things not seen is not some willy-nilly, well, I've just decided that this is my flavor that I'm going to go with. A conviction of things not seen is a rock-solid belief, a conviction that what God has said is trustworthy. Therefore, the future is certain. It's rooted in revelation. Faith takes this book at its word and says, God, I am trusting it, and what you say about the future, I am believing it, even though I cannot verify it with my eyes. I can't touch it. I can't taste it. I can't smell it. I can't necessarily audibly hear it. In other words, I can't empirically prove this. Nevertheless, I am trusting what you have said, and I am convicted that what you said will come to pass. Brothers and sisters, that is what the Bible calls faith. Now, having looked at what faith is, a, a deep-seated confidence in the presence and a conviction in the future, now let's look at some who, because the rest of this chapter delineates a ton of people who walked by faith. And I think this is going to be relatively uh, remarkable for you, because when you look at this hall of fame, all these great men and women of faith, well, these aren't exactly men and women that you would normally put in a hall of fame. These are sorts of folks that they had some rough lives. In fact, I want you to see, beginning in verse 4, you'll see Abel. If you look down at verse 5, Enoch is listed next. In verse 7, Noah is. In verse 8, Abraham is. In verse 11, Sarah is. In verse 17, we see Abraham mentioned yet again. In verse 21, we see, or verse 20, I should say, we see Isaac. In 21, we see Jacob. In 22, Joseph. 23, Moses. And then you go all the way down to verse 31, you'll see Rahab. And then there's a whole list of folks in verse 32, including Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, David and Samuel, and even the prophets. That's quite a list. But here's what's interesting about this list. As you read through these lists of heroes of the faith, men that have walked by faith, there's some commonalities. And the commonalities aren't what you might expect. One commonality is that the type of people who live by faith are sinners. Now, don't use that in the most simplistic term. Yes, of course, we're all sinners. I mean, these folks wrestled with sin. If you look through this list, this is a somewhat of a motley crew. You've got folks like, well, you know, Noah was a drunkard. And you'll look down and you'll see that Abraham, he was an idolater. He literally made idols. Isaac and Jacob, they were quite the team. Jacob, my word, he was uh, one guy. He was a liar. Joseph, you know all the crazy stuff he was into. And Moses, Moses ended up uh, disobeying God and was kept out of the promised land. It gets a little worse when you look at Rahab. She was actually a prostitute. And then if you go look down at all those judges in verse 32, my word, none of them. Just go look up the story of Jephthah and scratch your head wondering why he is in the listing of the heroes of the faith. This is an interesting crew, but it is a reminder to us that to live by faith is not to live perfectly. Moreover, to live by faith is not to have an exemplary, spotless life. To live by faith is to confess your sins, to turn from your sins, to trust 
in God who alone can make you righteous. To live by faith is to reckon with who you are and who God is. You see, this is a list of sinners. Moreover, it's a list of sufferers, which I think is an, a, very, a very important theme for us to draw out of this list of the heroes of the faith. For all these men paid a price for their faith, and that's kind of the point of this chapter where it illustrates Abel. And Abel was a hero of the faith because he died demonstrating his faith. Enoch was a hero of the faith. You look down at Noah. Noah was maligned for building that ark. He was a hero of the faith, suffering for the sake of obedience to God. So too is Abraham. I bet all of his family and friends thought he was nuts for leaving his town and going to this promised land to where he'd never been before. Nobody knew. Sarah, of course, she laughed at first, and I bet all kinds of folks were laughing with her once she began to believe that she would indeed have a child at such an old age. And you just keep going down through the list in my word. It's story after story of people who paid a great high price. In other words, faith is by definition costly. There's a reason Christ calls us to count the cost, take up our cross, and follow Him. For faith is always going to be maligned by a lost and dying world. There will be an outside world looking in wondering why on earth you're doing this. It doesn't make scientific sense. It doesn't make empirical sense. It doesn't make common sense to those whose minds are natural, to those whose minds have not been enlightened by the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Faith is going to come at a price. This list is a list of sufferers. It's a list of sinners, but it's also a list of steadfast men and women, for these were brothers and sisters who recognized that this was worth it, that Christ's name would be worth it. Therefore, they had a future tense assurance that gave them strength in the present tense persecution. Meaning, as they were presently suffering, they had a hope that what God said He'd do, He would do, which is the essence of faith. It's believing in the future to maintain your steadfast hope in the present. So my plea to you in light of this, as you just look at this list of faith, and recognize, oh God, thank you for being gracious to me, a sinner. Oh God, I confess that I have done, doubted you when I have as well been in the midst of suffering. I see now, Lord, that you have called us to suffer for the sake of your name. I see, oh God, that this list is my predecessor. I should look to this list and say, they finished well. I too can finish well. Oh God, help me to suffer well. Help me, O God, to trust you, to remain steadfast in the present by hoping in your certain future. Number two, we've now noticed who lived a life of faith. But may we conclude by turning, lastly, to just the first couple verses in verse tw uh, chapter 12, where we'll conclude with how to live a life of faith. And I, I'll admit, this is a pretty brief overview. These texts merit many sermons in and of themselves. But let's look at chapter 12. Well, let me read beginning in verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, in light of all those folks we just read about, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God." Here we see the writer of Hebrews call us to four things, in my judgment, four ways we ought to live a life of faith. And I alliterated them. They're all L's. They're super easy to remember. Maybe you could mark them down in your margin and make these a matter of prayer. Number one, we must learn, learn, and learn from whom? We must learn from those who have gone before us. Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, we have a great cloud of witnesses, not only in this book, but since that book has been published. There has been an increasing cloud of witnesses throughout the last 2,000 years of church history, which is why it's so life-giving to read Christian biography. Go read the biography of Adoniram Judson and see his faith in action. Go sit at the feet of David Brainerd and see how he wrestled with the Lord in the midst of despair and suffering. Go read some of these great works of men of church history and have your faith be strengthened from this cloud of witnesses. Look in this very church and find those who have walked with the Lord longer than you. 
That too, brothers and sisters, is a cloud of witnesses. You must learn from those whom God has placed in your life. Secondly, you must lay aside, the writer says. Lay aside what? Well, he says, lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And using that analogy of running in a race, he would say, just as a runner would want to lose any weight and get rid of any clothing that might slow him down, so too as a believer, we must lay aside every weight that slows us down. Lay aside those sins, those small little things that you keep dabbling in that you know are impeding your growth. That might mean for you this moment that you just pause and you confess those sins that you know are fogging your mind, you know are clouding your judgment, you know are distancing you from the Lord and say, Oh God, help me to die to these sins. Help me to put to death by the Spirit these deeds of the body that I might live for you. Help me, O oh God, to lay these aside. Number three, we must last. Now, what does that mean? I think we see it pretty clearly at the latter half, the third clause, I would say, of verse 1. And it says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How do you run with endurance? Well, it'd just be like if you go out and jog. If you're anything like me, that first mile is tough. You go out for a nice jog and you run in that first mile, my word, it is a tough mile. But you must endure. You must count the cost. You must pay the price. You must remember that no pain, no gain. You keep going. And before you know it, you recognize that you are a living embodiment of perseverance. You are lasting. And his call to us as believers is to live by faith is to persevere. It is to press on. It is to press forward despite all the attacks of the enemy that are waging war with your soul. It's running with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, Perseverance is always going to be a matter of the Holy Spirit supporting and protecting you. And so, brothers and sisters, if you want to persevere, it's not a matter of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. It's not a matter of muscling through. You're going to persevere principally on your knees. You're going to persevere with a whole lot of tears. You are going to plead for God to protect you and do for you what you cannot do for yourself. To last in the Christian life is to be a man and a woman of fervent prayer. And lastly, we must look. For we see in verse 2, what does he say? Look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. The reason we must look to Christ, that looking to Jesus is so important, I think it's best captured in this simple illustration with which I'd like to close. I've shared it before, so forgive me if you've heard it, but I think it's appropriate. Imagine you were one of the Israelites experiencing the great Passover in the book of Exodus, right before God was to free His people. You had heard that the angel of death was coming, and the only way to escape the angel of death was to put the blood of a lamb over your door. Well, imagine you witness two Israelites standing outside their doors, one Israelite is shaking in his boots. He's scared and he says, I'm so nervous. I've put the blood of the lamb over the door, but I'm really nervous. You know, what, what if something happens? I'm trusting God. I, I believe him. I take him at his word, but I'm scared to death. Whereas the other Israelite who's in this conversation, he is confidently and proudly with his arms crossed saying, I have full trust in God. I too have put the blood of the lamb over the door. I am ready for this angel of death to come. Now, which of those two men had saving faith? The one shaken in his boots or the one with utter and complete confidence? And the reason this illustration is so critical is because the truth is biblically both are saved. Both have saving faith. Why? Because it is not the strength of your faith that saves you. It is the object of your faith that saves you. It is Christ and Christ alone who saves, which is why we as weak and needy sinners must look to Jesus, the object, indeed the perfecter of our faith. So do not look within and judge your spirituality by how strong the fruit of your faith is. 
Look to Jesus this moment and watch as you continue to look to Him, to just raise your eyes and look to Him. You will watch your faith be strengthened and you will experience the sweet joy that was set before Him as He endured the pain, as He endured the cross, as He purchased our redemption. Join Him. Indeed, I pray for my own soul that I will join Him in this great project of suffering for the sake of His name until that day when He calls us home. May I pray for you that you and I will live these lives of faith. Father in heaven, do this, I pray, for Jesus' sake and for the good of this church. Use us, we pray. Protect us, we pray. And God, I ask that you would make us learn, lay aside, last, and look to you. In Jesus' name I ask this. Amen.